Welcome to everyone. Um, this is live at the lab from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, I'm Rebecca Leshen, Executive Director of the Banbury Center. Before I introduce Dr. Tubison, I want to draw your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screens. It can be used to submit your questions at any time, and we'll try to read as many as we can at, during the Q&A part of the, the presentation. I also want to add that after today's talk, if you want more information about Dr. Tubison's work, his lab, and the work of the Cancer Center, you can head over to the lab's website, cshl.edu. And now I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. David Tubison. Dave is the Roy J. Zuckerberg Professor of Cancer Research here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and Director of our, can our Cancer Center. He is both a scientist leading cutting edge research at the frontiers of cancer biology and a clinician treating patients and working to bring research advances to the bedside. Dave also serves as chief scientist for the Lust Garden Foundation, and he's president elect for the American Association for Cancer Research. With all of these responsibilities, it's always a special treat to hear Dave speak about his work. So I'm personally excited to hear him talk today about some hot off the presses work from his lab. Without further ado, I'll hand the Zoom mic over to Dave. Okay, thank you very much, Rebecca, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for dialing in for our first live at the lab Zoom meeting. I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, some exciting research that has come out of our laboratory um, that we think will make a large impact on our ability to solve significant problems for the good of pancreatic cancer patients. Pancreatic cancer is a serious condition with only 9% of patients surviving five years after their diagnosis. The two main problems we have in pancreatic cancer is the inability to detect the disease early and our inability to treat the disease in a patient once they've been diagnosed. When my Les Garden Foundation dedicated laboratory was established at Cold Spring Harbor in 2012, we started on a new quest to develop a new model for pancreatic cancer that was based upon our ability to culture fresh tumor tissue from patients. This model is called the organoid and was shown on the uh, introductory slide, which I'll ask the uh, organizers to put up, please. Organoids can be produced from anyone, um, and they allow us to look deeply into the process of health and disease in that part of the body. Organoids were originally developed by Professor Hans Klevers of the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And Hans and his lab taught us these methods here at Cold Spring Harbor following a conference that we convened at the Banbury Meeting Center. This is the location that Dr. Rebecca Leshen, who introduced me, uh, directs. Our Banbury Center is kind of a Camp David for science where many of our important meetings have been held. Following this Banbury meeting, Bruce Stillman, the president of Cold Spring Harbor, and Bob Vizza, who was the chairman of the Lusgarden Foundation, encouraged and supported my laboratory with substantial funding to take on this project at a grand scale, to make dozens of organoids from patients with pancreatic cancer in attempts to learn something new about this disease. Well, eight years into the project, we have learned many new things about pancreatic cancer. I'll ask you to look at this opening slide. On the left, you see a green ball um, with some red structures in it. Each of these uh, colored objects is a cell, which together makes a soccer ball. Like a soccer ball where you have black and uh, white octagons, this organoid is a cobblestone of many cell types. This is what they look like, and you can see them under the microscope. They have colors because we scientifically put colors into them uh, so that it would make it easier for us to see. And so again, we learned how to make these organoids, and then we asked ourselves, what, what has it taught us? Well, our first 
set of experiments, which I would call a pilot project, um, we realized that the organoids that we generated looked like the cancer that came out of the patients um, at all levels, at the levels of molecular characterization, looking at the DNA and the RNA, looking at the proteins. These are the molecular signatures or the sounds of the disease that we can uh, we can measure and follow. Um, so that first effort into looking at pancreas cancer was quite successful. And uh, I called it a pilot project, but really it took the whole village in my laboratory and many individuals outside my laboratory here at Cold Spring Harbor, as well as Hans's lab in, in Holland. And it was a really exciting uh, finding. This really motivated us to go to the next level. And this is where Again, our collaboration with the Les Garden Foundation helped us. I presented this uh, information to the uh, corporate board of the Les Garden, how we were learning about pancreas cancer. And as a scientist and a doctor, I was excited about that. And their question was, well, why can't you do this faster and bigger so that we can get this into the clinic as soon as possible? And um, I didn't disagree with that, but that, that certainly uh, put a different emphasis on the project, that we were going to scale this up and take it on as a, as a large challenge um, uh, for my lab and for Cold Spring Harbor uh, in general. And so we started a second project where instead of studying five or 10 samples, we were studying upwards of almost 100 samples from pancreatic cancer patients. And this was directed by Dr. Irve Tiriak, an extremely talented postdoctoral fellow in my lab. In this study, we realized that we could actually learn whether a patient was going to respond to a therapy or not. And in fact, we were able to identify a signature of that response, um, something we could measure in the organoid. And the reason why this is important is that if a doctor ahead of time has a signature of drug response, they could potentially predict the right medicine to give a patient. Uh, this field has been called personalized medicine and is usually attributed to the genetic changes um, in a sample. Um, in our case, it was actually a gene expression signature that Irve found with his colleagues, Professor Alex Krasnitz here at Cold Spring Harbor and his postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Pascal Below. Our findings from this uh, study are summarized on a slide that I will share with you. So this was the, um, the, our findings from our large study looking at organoids where we could find a signature of drug response. So with my mouse on the left, we had a patient with pancreatic cancer. We would get a sample and grow the organoids, which are again, these round structures. They're not pretty green and red right now because this is a light microscope. But they are these very interesting round circles you can see uh, very readily um, in the tissue culture room. From the organoids, we could test on the lower part of this slide what was in the DNA and what was in the RNA. This is, again, the computer code that we have in every cell. Um, the computer code is read into RNA. That's turned into proteins. We could learn that from every sample, and we can test medicines. We call this pharmacotyping. These are chemical structures of drugs that you could give a patient to ask, does the drug work? And if it works, how well does it work? That information could be synthesized by combining the molecular and the pharmacology information. And this diagram on top is meant to represent the synthesis of information, systems biology. With that information, we could then look at all of our patients. So in this case, we could spread the patients out and we could find signatures of drug sensitivity. So on the upper right, this little blue dot represents a sample very sensitive to a medicine. And it makes sense because we know a mutation exists in that sample. More importantly though, as shown on the bottom, these are what's called a waterfall plot where waterfall is supposed to flow down due to gravity and so that's what this is. A tumor is shrinking in this patient after eight weeks of receiving medicine. On the other hand, the tumors at this end are growing 
they're in the, going in the opposite direction. And if you just look at it without knowing anything deeply scientific, you realize on the left you have a lot of blue and on the right you have a lot of red. In this case, the blue is the signature of sensitivity to medicines that we got from our organoids. And the red was the lack of that sensitivity signature. So this really suggested to us that we were on the right path um, with these organoids. And um, this has led us to propose a clinical trial with the Lust Garden Foundation and with multiple sites in the United States. Memorial Sloan Kettering, Northwell Health, Johns Hopkins Hospital, and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. The clinical trial is to test whether what we found in our research experiment is really true in patients. And Cold Spring Harbor, working with Northwell Health, has actually set up an organoid facility to do this work right here in Woodbury. And so this is a very exciting trial that Dennis uh, Planker will be directing at, at the scientific side. It's so exciting that Stand Up to Cancer has decided to help sponsor this trial also. This is a very large organization uh, throughout the states as well as internationally, whose job it is to motivate all of us to find better clinical trials for all cancer patients as fast as possible. And so this was really terrific, and it's an ongoing activity right now. Now this was published in 2018, and based upon this work, we then knew the organoids were telling us important things about pancreas cancer. We still had one real problem. Look at these patients over here who are in the red. That means the medicines were not working. And we see this as doctors, nurses, and family members of patients with pancreatic cancer. There's a subset of patients that no matter what you do, you can't help them. They get sick so fast, even if you give them medicines, the medicines bounce off of them. It's about a quarter to a third of the patients. And it's really always been a problem, uh, obviously, for the patients and for those of us on the clinical and scientific side, but we could never study those patients. So we had the organoids, we were asking ourselves, could we see those red samples earlier in some fashion? And so this is what leads us to the research that we're talking about today. We had a, a very talented uh, postdoctoral fellow in our laboratory, Dr. Koji Miyabayashi. Koji uh, trained as a gastroenterologist in Tokyo. He came to the States to learn something new and something transformative about biomedical science as it pertains to pancreatic cancer. He sought us out here at Cold Spring Harbor because he had heard about our organoid program. And I explained to him, we now have these great model systems. We just haven't learned this one really important thing about the disease, which is can we in vivo, meaning inside a body, learn why certain patients do not respond to medicines whereas others do. Um, and so he took on a project um, that actually is helping to address that, that I'll explain in the next two slides. Koji took those little organoids that you can't see with your eyes, but you can see it pretty readily with the magnifying glass. And he put them in a little syringe, the size of an insulin syringe, for those of you who know what that means. It's like the size of a pin. And he was able to go into the duct of the mouse pancreas. Now, most of you have never seen a pancreas. Your pancreas is an essential organ. It lives behind your stomach. It allows you to digest food and ba balance blood sugar. The digestive enzymes from the pancreas flow into the intestine and allow you to break down that nice lunch you had before you met me today. Or maybe you're eating your lunch right now. The ducts that the digestive enzymes flow down are tubes, just like you have tubes of pipes in your house that water flows through it. That's where the cancer comes from. Koji went with his little syringe into the duct of the mouse pancreas and injected into that pancreas through the duct the human organoids I showed you pictures of that Hervé uh, and Dennis uh, originated for us. He identified two types of behavior in the mice that the organoids were implanted with. I will describe them very simply as slow and fast. In the case of slow, what happened was the human organoid cells shown here in orange grew very slowly, but grew outward into the duct. 
In the case of fast, the cells were fast, which means they proliferated, they made more progeny, and they drilled holes right into the mouse pancreas, like a termite would through wood. So these were the fast samples. If you look to the right, you see what that looks like if you were to take tissue from the animals. This is the normal pancreas. This is actually very healthy looking tissue. The digestive enzymes are made here. Here's the islet that makes insulin, allows you to balance blood sugar. Here's human pancreas cancer cells growing in the duct of a mouse pancreas. Look at this. In a slow model, all those cells built up just like a long line waiting to go somewhere. The fast sample is different. Look at it. Total mess. It just destroyed the pancreas, chewed right through it. So these were profound differences in biology. It turned out that these behaviors reflected the two types of pancreas cancer I told you about. The very aggressive, which would be fast, and the very indolent, which would be slow. When I say very indolent, it's still a lethal disease, but it takes years to um, hurt the patient as opposed to weeks. The reason why that's so important will become apparent on the next slide because now we can compare the two models. By comparing the two models, we realized there were very few differences between the models. One difference, though, was a gene called KRAS. Stands for Kirsten RAS. This is a bad gene. This is the terrorist gene of pancreatic cancer. We have not figured out a way to stop this gene yet, but we've known about this gene for 40 years. This gene was discovered here at Cold Spring Harbor by one of our terrific scientists, Michael Wiggler. Michael discovered it at the same time as three other labs throughout the country. And so we've known about this gene for 40 years, but we haven't yet been able to stop it. We realized KRAS in a slow model on the left was lower than a fast model on the right. We then found out that we could just put a little more KRAS in the left to turn it into what you see on the right. Look at the left, beautiful orderly structures, single blue dots, which are the nuclei. Look on the right, total chaos. Cells growing on top of each other, cells fighting for oxygen and nutrients. This is bad cancer. And so KRAS was a part of it, but also KRAS instructed 13 new genes that we had never really thought about before. And these new genes are our new drug targets in this disease. This is why we're so excited today. Um, and uh, this was the story that I wanted to tell you about that came from our eight year investment on a topic that was just an idea eight years ago. No real evidence that it would work or not. But when you work in a place like Cold Spring Harbor, we're told to go out and work on things that no one else will, no one else can. Um, and that's the type of thing that we do um, at a place like this. So uh, this is what we've done so far here with this pancreas cancer. Our job is to stop RAS and or stop any of these 13 genes. And we're working hard on that today. Um, and we expect there to be some very exciting things to tell you about tomorrow. And so the work I've told you about is not my work alone. In fact, I am just the MC. That I, many, many people participate in this work and I wanna thank them for it. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, Dagnia um, Goldschmitz and Jessica Giordano um, from Scientific Communications who had the great idea to have me tell other people about this as opposed to just the, um, the journalists and the scientific literature. And also the audiovisual crew for working with me um, to make uh, this possible today. Um, the, the presentation would not be possible without the dedication and excellence of the scientists who are part of the laboratory. You heard about Koji. Koji's already back in Tokyo. His paper came out yesterday, and that's very important because now he can get a, a proper position at his hospital. This is Koji right here with the red arrow. Um, he was supported by many people. Hervé Tiriak, shown here, is one who really started the human organoid a program. It's been taken over by Dennis uh, Planker with tons and tons of help from Lindsay Baker um, and Young Park and many of the other individuals you see in this picture. Hans Klebers from Holland 
shared his expertise with us early on. He didn't have to, but he did. And it led to a great partnership. We have partners also in, in Canada at the University of Toronto, Steve Gallinger and his team. And that 27 gauge needle I told you about was a trick that Koji learned from Monty Winslow, a professor at Stanford. Now it, it did take really a lot of uh, individuals, but also took a lot of financial support from various foundations. The National Cancer Institute, um, supported by taxpayer dollars and terrific uh, leadership, uh, deserves a lot of credit for supporting our organoid program. Northwell Health, our, our clinical affiliate, um, that's become a terrific partner uh, for our projects, uh, deserves much credit for our organoid program. In fact, the organoid facility I alluded to that we set up is again a partnership between Northwell Health and Jim Crawford, their head of pathology, and Dennis and Sydney Gary here and Priya um, uh, Sri Devi and many others. Um, the Les Garden Foundation, whom I'm so indebted to and, uh, and so admiring of, have supported all of what my laboratory has done, have really pushed me um, on this project. I was boogie boarding and they put me on a surfboard and they said, you have to go faster, you have to use a longboard, all that stuff. And uh, it's been great. And our job in the Les Garden Foundation is to put ourselves out of work. We haven't done that yet, uh, but that's our intention. And we're still moving in that direction. Cold Spring Harbor, again, it, you know, allowed uh, me to think big about this. And Bruce Stillman, our president and CEO, you know, is like Dr. Bob Vizza um, and, Dr. and Mr. Andy Les Garden today. Push, push, push. Now, um, lastly, for the first time ever, I get to thank a family member. This is our baby daughter, uh, 21 and a half years ago. And here she is 21 and a half years now, later. Um, so this is Katie, who um, graduated university. And for those of you wondering what you're going to happen to your kids to, in these days when they graduate, they're going to get jobs. Uh, Katie, Katie's gotten a job, fortunately. But in the interim, she is now a freelance volunteer speechwriter. And she helped make sure that all the sciencey stuff I said came out a little bit more uh, uh, decipherable to the rest of you. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of her, and I want to thank her uh, especially for helping uh, uh, today. So please learn about uh, Cold Spring Harbor, our lab, and the incredible science that all of the people here do. Our goal is to solve problems and then to move to the next problem. And with your help, um, we'll do so. And now I want to um, open this up for questions under the oversight of Dr. Rebecca Lashan, and who directs our world famous uh, Banbury uh, Meeting Center. Thank you, Dave, and um, I'm giving you a round of applause. I know we really can't clap through Zoom, so um, virtual claps all around. Um, we do have some questions coming in, and so I'm gonna start with um, a question about the model, how this might be transferable to be used in other types of cancers, especially the really bad cancers, um, and how does this model differ from other types of animal models that have been used to study different cancer types? Yeah, this is, a, this is an excellent question. So what we have done is made an in situ model. So you've heard the term in vitro, which is outside a body, in vivo, inside a body. The, the, the Latin term in situ is within the tissue where life and disease occur. So by putting a human cell into a mouse duct, we got the human cell to lay down on the basement membrane of the duct and kind of elbow its way in into the crowd of mouse epithelial cells. We learned something cool because of that. And so the question from the audience is, couldn't you do this with other types of malignancy? And, and my answer back is we should be able to. Um, my laboratory is, is kind of focused on pancreas cancer, and so we haven't tried to go beyond it, but I did uh, tease our collaborators from Verona and from Utrecht that we, and, and, and Dave Spector, who's uh, the director of research here at the lab, that we should try to do the same for our other cancer types. And I think Dave is interested in trying this in breast, where again, it would be analogous, try to put breast organoids into a mouse um, breast gland and see if we can get in situ models. I'm hopeful that it will work. Uh, we haven't spent time on it. We've just encouraged others to do so. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a terrific question, uh, actually, because it allows you to study 
within the context of the cancer, many processes that you'll miss in a dish or miss if you just inject it orthotopically or subcutaneously. So it's a very sophisticated question actually, and, and, I, and I thank you to the person who asked it. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of questions coming in about KRAS and specifically um, why we don't yet have a KRAS inhibitor. Um, are there any pan KRAS approaches um, that might be efficacious? Can you comment on, um, on that aspect? So KRAS is a um, gene that when mutated uh, is dominant in a pancreas cancer cell. If you were to remove the KRAS from a pancreas cancer cell, in general, it won't hurt you. So you would think it, it has all the features of the, the bad gene you would wanna make medicines against. Medicines work really well when a protein is a moving machine that you can stick your finger in to slow it down. That's what drugs are. They slow down protein motion. KRAS, when it's mutated, actually moves slow. So it's actually an example of a mutation that makes a, a protein less mobile, less dynamic. We don't have drugs that speed up proteins, only drugs that slow down proteins. So this is conceptually challenging for chemists to think, how do I make a drug that does work and actually causes things to move? Now that said, the mutation in KRAS is a glycine to something else. So again, a little primer here is we have 20 amino acids that encode life. And these amino acids are small molecules that have a basic end and an acidic end, and then something called an R group. So if you're lost, don't worry. It's just think about it in terms of Legos. There are 20 types of Lego pieces. And the Lego piece that you gotta have to have a normal RAS is the smallest one called a glycine. So if anything gets introduced into it, what happens is that amino acid is, is, is no longer as flexible as it was before. And that means the RAS molecule is less flexible. We haven't been able to, again, replace the glycine with something else, but one of the mutations in RAS is glycine to one called cysteine. Cysteine contains sulfur. And if in that setting, we have a drug for it, but that's the mutation you find in lung cancer, not in pancreas cancer. So in pancreas cancer, we have glycine to aspartate or valine as the two common ones. And I know I've gotten deeper into science than possibly some of you wanna hear. The bottom line is we don't have a way to bind it to the glycine or, uh, sorry, to the valine or the aspartate to fix it. So we haven't given up. But what we're trying to do now is to design new chemical strategies to fix RAS. And actually at Cold Spring Harbor, we are taking the plunge in this direction. We've decided to invest in novel forms of chemistry, meaning chemistry that's even beyond what you find in pharma. And so it's hard to say that because pharma feels that it's fearless, but the reality is pharma needs to actually make things happen quickly or they lose their ability to do things. So we're gonna to try to do something in academia. Um, Nick Tonks, uh, my partner in the uh, Cancer Center, who's the deputy director, um, he and Linda Van Els have started a new building, uh, the Demerick building, just down the hill, where they're gonna look at physiology of cancer, but they're also gonna look at the biochemistry of cancer. And in that building, we are going to bring our first chemist to Cold Spring Harbor, and he is gonna take on RAS. And we're gonna try and to do things that nobody else has done before. So RAS is bad, we need to fix RAS. If we do, we would all be you know, done probably with one of our major questions. Patients would definitely be better, uh, but this is not a topic for you know, you know, someone to take on blithely. It's almost like me and the organoids eight years ago, uh, where you have to have a lot of support and allow people to, to give you support, but leave you alone uh, to accomplish it. It's a major, a major task though, and we're gonna, we are gonna take it on. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, so we have a lot of questions about the organoids themselves. So um, both what percentage, um, once you uh, try to create them, what percentage are actually viable and, and what are they made of? Is it how diverse are the cell types within that organ organoid? 
Yeah, no, great question. So what an organoid is, is you take a small biopsy uh, from a normal tissue or from a, a tumor and you disaggregate it, meaning you chop it up physically and using enzymes into smaller parts. And then you embedded it in gelatin material, just like jello that you could have in your refrigerator. Now, different from jello though, it has like fancy things in it that make cells happy and other fancy things that make certain things not happy. So there's a cell type that tends to grow fast called a fibroblast. This cell fills in the gaps whenever you have damage to your body, helps heal cuts. And it's a great cell type, except if you're trying to make an organoid, it can overgrow the culture. And so you try to dampen that cell down to allow epithelial cells to grow up. And so you have a cocktail of good factors and suppressive factors, and you grow out the epithelial cells as quickly as you can. You do get different types of epithelial cells. Some are normal, some carry mutations. So in your mixture, it is polyclonal. You'll have different types of cells. You can study them as a, as a group, or you can study them as independently because you can separate them physically, one cell in a well and things like that. And so you can easily grow a clone or a polyclonal population. Um, but it is very doable. And Hervé, who started this project, got it to the point where Dennis, who now runs with it, has developed ways to get an organoid within a week. When we started out, it was two months. And this is very important because we want to be able to take a sample from a patient. We don't even know if they have cancer. Get a piece, grow it up fast, ask what is it and how do we treat it? So that that information can go, for example, to a physician. And so when the patient comes back to the clinic, the physician says, you know, unfortunately you have lung cancer. Fortunately, though, we know why you have lung cancer and how to treat you. This is me imagining, you know, for the me near to medium term future. But that's that's the direction this research is taking us now. Great. Thank you. Um, and so, you know, you just mentioned that scenario of um, going back and forth between the clinic and the samples. Um, we have a couple of questions about the turnaround time um, and and how this might you know, realistically get into practice? Well, I mean, for us, the, the, the questions should always be answered at the scientific level first. And so what we've published so far are rigorous scientific investigations. What our laboratory is about to engage in is something called the PASS-1 clinical trial, which again involves those clinical sites that I list that I mentioned in the United States, as well as in Canada, supported by the Les Garden Foundation and Stand Up to Cancer. This trial will, will achieve 150 patient sample biopsies. So there will be 150 patients enrolled. These samples will come to Cold Spring Harbor where Dennis Planker and his crew will try their best to turn them into organoids. We're not running at 100% efficiency in this regard. We run about 75%. It appears that our number is very similar to everybody else, but you know we probably have more experience in this than, than others. The 75% of the samples that do grow out, we will then ask, how quickly can we generate that organoid? How quickly can we learn what is mutated in the cell and what drugs work best in that cell so we can give that information back to the treating doctors? That test that we're trying to develop in this trial will, will essentially tell us did we guess right? Because the patients, the 150 patients will be treated with A or B. We're gonna treat the patients with everything, A and B separately. We'll ask, should A work in the patient or should B work in the patient? We'll go back to the doctors and say, this is what the sample had in it. This is how it responded to the medicine. What did you find? If it turns out we predicted correctly what actually happened to the patient, that becomes a body of data that Andrew Whiteley here and our business development office and the Les Garden Foundation and the state of New York will together put together as a application to have a laboratory developed test. When you have an LDT, you can then propose a trial to use this, this method prospectively. In that study, we would call PASS-2. We would get a sample, tell the doctor what medicine to give the patient, they would give the medicine. And so it would be a prospective trial. And if we predict correctly on a patient, well, then it means it is a predictive 
test and you know other people should use the test. So I, again, that was a, a sketchy way through how we would go from science to medical application, but that, that's in fact how tests are, are developed. And can I, just so for people who want to learn more about the clinical trial, is there a place, is, there, is it on our website? Can they go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov? Where's the best place to get information about where those are being conducted? Yeah, this is a great question too. And so the trial has gone through um, the IRB um, in Toronto. Uh, Jennifer Knox is the PI of the trial. Dr. Elizabeth Jaffe is going to be the U.S. Uh, you know, PI of the four sites here. Um, Wasif Saif from Northwell, Ken Yu from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and uh, Brian Wolpen uh, from Dana-Farber. I don't believe the trial is yet listed on uh, uh, NIHtrials.gov, but it will be. Uh, as soon as it's gone through the, I, the institutional review boards at all the places I just listed. Um, and so it's, it's in the works. Um, I think you can contact the Lust Garden Foundation you know, for information about the trial because uh, they all, we will also be um, talking about it through, through that through their foundation. Great, thank you. Now we've had this question coming in a lot and it's, it's headed back to KRAS. Okay. Um, is, is KRAS a synthetic lethal, lethal pair with any of the 13 genes? Um, I, not that we know of. The 13 genes that we see are the children of KRAS, meaning they are KRAS dependent genes. And so we are asking right now whether or not any of them are sufficient so are, are any you know to actually give the same effect as kras or are they necessary to get the effect of kras and so we're doing the necessity and sufficiency experiments of the 13 genes right now <clears throat> but excellent excellent question okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go back to um thinking about a little bit bigger picture is there any role of the um, the whole person or the environment in how um, these different cell types or how these different cancers progress? Is there a role either of other um, components of the person's, bo person's body or physiology or the environment, their nutrition, things like that? What is that, what is that role? So um, another great question. Pancreatic cancer is uh, a bad cancer, as I mentioned. It's becoming, if it isn't already, the second cause of mortality due to cancer in America and in the Western world. It is a disease that is dependent upon the acquisition of the mutations. I've mentioned one, KRAS. This is the main one. It turns out most of us are end up going to end up with a KRAS mutation. It's easy to get. It's just a single base pair change. So KRAS by itself is not enough. And so as you're mentioning, Rebecca, what else? Why else do people get pancreas cancer? Is there anything people could do to lower their risk, et cetera? It looks like inflammation in the pancreas is a huge deal. And so I'm gonna talk about inflammation for a second. When you get a sunburn, that's inflammation. When you get poison ivy, that's inflammation. Now imagine those two processes happening inside your body. Well. It, it makes you uncomfortable thinking about it, right? It's gonna hurt, it's gonna itch, all of that. Inflammation, when it happens in tissues where the tissue is replenishing itself, is not nearly as bad as when it happens in tissues that do not replenish. And I'll, I'll again have to give a miniature primer of what I mean. We all make new blood every day. We have many cells that get out of the bone marrow and do things for us and go away. And so we need our bone marrow to make new blood. Our skin is like that too. On the outside and inside of our body, we have cells that have special functions like keep things out, which is our exterior skin, or keep things in, which is our interior skin. Now that skin deals with a lot of abuse, physical abuse on the outside and microbial abuse on the inside. So we're constantly shedding skin. So inflammation in those two compartments we can replace those compartments. Our pancreas is like many of our vital organs where it's a pretty sleepy tissue. After you've developed into an adult, you don't make new pancreas cells very often. So if you get inflammation in a tissue like your pancreas, it can really damage it because you'll lose function and you have to somehow heal it. Now I talked about the fibroblasts a minute ago. These are the cells that fill in gaps when you have tissue damage. You have fibroblasts all over your body. They are very clever cells. 
They're kind of like, you know, uh, your parents who fix the problems that you create when you're a kid. The fibroblasts, they're really smart. And so when they see a problem, they go there and they try to fill in the gap. Now in the pancreas, when there's inflammation, those cells that make the digestive enzymes, they get very unhappy. And so think of it like a beehive. You've all seen beehives. You've tried to stay away from them. Sometimes though, maybe when you were younger, you did stupid things like stuck a stick into a beehive and the bees came flying out and you got stung. Well, imagine if you actually put, patched up the beehive so they couldn't get out. They would figure out a way out. They would dig a hole through the beehive. Your pancreas is the same way. You have digestive enzymes that have to get out. If you block the pancreas duct, the digestive enzymes just chew their way out of the pancreas and you cause inflammation of the pancreas. The fibroblasts I mentioned proliferate like crazy. That's the setting in which that RAS mutation turns into a cancer. We had a very interesting uh, project uh, just two years ago that one a very talented postdoc, uh, Danielle Engel, uh, led up, and it was an inflammation project. And she showed that inflammation in the pancreas promoted pancreas cancer on a grand scale. And so, Rebecca, in a long way to answer your short question, inflammation is a bad thing. How do you cause inflammation in your pancreas? Well, usually it's just bad luck. However, if you drink too much too often, you will get pancreatitis. And so try to limit your alcohol intake if possible. If you have a lot of gallstones, you could end up with pancreatitis. If you take the wrong medicines or have a reaction to a medicine or a drug, uh, that can cause pancreatitis. Finally though, obesity, which is a condition where you're plump, uh, this can actually promote inflammation of your pancreas too, both directly and indirectly through changing the microbial flora in your intestines. And so there are things that we can do to lower our risk of pancreas cancer, um, and most of them center around lowering inflammation. And the one I should have said first is tobacco. And so smoking is a high risk factor for pancreas cancer. We think it's mostly because it promotes inflammation in the pancreas. So, you know, again, these are the things I would suggest uh, to all of us. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, there's there are a lot of questions, you know, you'll obviously know that a big problem in pancreatic cancer is early diagnosis. And is there any hope that some of these um, genes you've identified could be used diagnostically either through a so-called liquid biopsy um, before you sort of see something or have uh, broader symptoms? Yeah, so again, another um, terrific question. As I said in the beginning, we really only have two problems in pancreas cancer. We can't detect it early, and when, once we detect it, we can't, we can't save the patient. So could you use the model I just showed you to detect it early? We think so. And so an extremely talented uh, graduate student in, in the laboratory, Toby Loba Oni, he was in the last slide, um, he has made some really interesting new reagents to see pancreatic cancer in our laboratory. And he's now testing whether his reagents will allow us to detect precisely what you're saying, early signs of invasion in pancreatic cancer using the same models that Koji developed. Uh, and so we, we think in general the question that was asked is, is in the right direction. I don't know if it will be one of the 13 genes or that process, uh, but, but that's, that's exactly you know, what is needed uh, today. Thank you, Dave. Um, so uh, slightly in the same vein, and I'm going to I'm going to give you two more questions and then I'm going to let you off the hook for today. Um, so if the there's a question about if the uh, a patient's primary pancreatic tumor has been removed, are you still able to um, biopsy from a say a, a re recurrence in the lung and still use it in the same way or does it need to come from the pancreas, the primary tumor? You know, really terrific question. And so I mentioned that Koji was able to use a 27 gauge needle to inject the organoids into the duct of the mouse pancreas. We can use small needle biopsies of pancreas cancer to grow the organoids also. And they can be from the primary tumor or from metastases. And so what Hervé was able to pioneer early on is small biopsies from metastases could be used to study this disease just as much as a surgical specimen. 
Um, and so, yes, uh, Dennis and his crew had many examples of using metastatic uh, small biopsies to study uh, this disease and to identify new ways to treat um, that particular uh, patient sample. Okay, and here's your, your last question, a really interesting one that I, that I was specifically saving for last. Are there any animals or, or organisms that don't get pancreatic cancer? And could we study those to see, you know, what is, makes them special in order to prevent it in humans? Yeah, no, so this is, this is also an, an interesting, you know, question. Can you look at, you know, the other end of the spectrum and work backwards that way? Well, um, mice did not get pancreas cancer before they met us. Um, and so that was uh, an animal that never saw pancreas cancer before. And, and using genetics, we, we did generate that. But what about long-lived animals? I would say that would be the more fair comparison. And so the long-lived animals that you know we know about would be animals like elephants. Um, and when you look at elephants, they in general don't get a lot of cancer. Now, you know, they, they don't have steak very often for dinner and they haven't been found to s smoke a cigar. You know, they're vegetarians. And um, despite their huge size, you know, they really do not get cancer. Now, they have very unusual genetics. Um, for example, they have many copies of a gene called P53, and that may be part of the reason why they don't get uh, really any cancer. Um, there is a, another animal that we've been studying at, at Cold Spring Harbor, which is the bat. And so the bat is very topical because the bat, you know, also we think of as the source for the coronavirus, which is ravaging uh, society right now. Um, Dick McCombie, who is one of our, um, our main geneticists here at the laboratory, has a project where he's been sequencing the bat. Uh, and again, the project started before coronavirus was, was happening um, in efforts to understand why do bats, which can live for decades, also not get cancer. And the bat has a very high metabolic rate. Um, they're about the size of a mouse, but they have a huge wingspan. So they look, you know, the size of a of a of a seagull instead. Um, we still don't know what we're going to find in, in that experiment, but we have been we have been thinking about this, um, which is the question you know from the audience. Uh, my, my guess is it's a combination of human risks, like the ones I mentioned. We do ingest tobacco, we do ingest alcohol. We probably have more pancreatitis than other animal species, is my guess. Um, so. We, we, we don't have an answer, but my guess is it's pancreatitis. We are more pancreatitis prone, you know, than, than other animals. Um, but, you know, clever idea. Uh, thank you uh, to the audience for, uh, for that one. Thank you, Dave. Um, I do, we did have some questions we weren't able to get to. And so I wanna encourage everyone for more information um, to visit the Cold Spring Harbor Lab website. Um, that's cshl.edu. There's a, a great story um, specifically on the work that, that Dave talked about today. So you can get more information there. His work is published, so you can check that out. Um, and you can also get more information about our cancer center. Um, it's also great to follow us on Twitter at CSHL. Um, and there, there were a few comments about early warning signs of pancreatic cancer. And so in that sense, I'd encourage you also to visit the Lust Garden Foundation website. That's a, a really great resource and to follow them on Twitter. Um, so I'd like to thank Dave Tuvison for sharing his important work. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today for Live at the Lab.